This footage captures Kenya Monye as she stumbles her way into a hotel near the club she had been at with friends shortly before. But just hours after this footage was captured, Kenya would be dead. And though her death alone would take months to uncover, it would take police even longer to piece together all of the horrific details of that evening. Before we start, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the loved ones of Kenya Monhe, who fell victim to the abominable acts described in this case. <laughs> Meet Kenya Monye, a 19-year-old woman originally from Honduras. Kenya emigrated to the United States at 12 years old to join her mother, who had left Honduras, to build a better life and create more opportunities in America. Kenya's mother, Maria, had married a man named Tony, and when Kenya arrived, she immediately embraced Tony as a member of the family and began to refer to him as dad. And Tony was a kind and loving man who quickly became the father figure that Kenya had never had. When Kenya arrived in America, she spoke very little English, but she was smart and an outgoing girl, which allowed Kenya to pick up the language quickly, and she became known as someone who could make friends easily due to her kind, warm, and caring nature. As time went on, Kenya grew into a fun-loving teenager who enjoyed a very active social life, but was similarly comfortable at home, surrounded by her family. The family lived in Aurora, Colorado, which is located just east of Denver. Despite Aurora's relatively small population of just 380,000 residents, it is known as the Gateway to the Rockies, given its location at the foot of the Front Range. After graduating high school, Kenya began studying broadcasting at a local college where she quickly excelled. She had a natural talent for public speaking and a confident personality that made her a natural fit for a broadcasting role. Soon after Kenya started college, she moved out of the family home to live with her boyfriend, Louis. Kenya was generally responsible and well-behaved, but she did enjoy time out partying with her friends. She wasn't old enough to drink or go clubbing, so Kenya acquired a fake ID so she could enjoy the nights out dancing with her friends and going to clubs which were located close to her apartment. On the 31st of March 2011, Kenya made plans to meet some friends at the 24K Lounge in downtown Denver. They reserved a table and ordered their favorite cocktails and shots. As Kenya was small of stature, being only 4 foot 11 inches and 100 pounds, it didn't take long for the alcohol to have a great effect on her, making her stumble as she walked and attempted to dance. In the early hours of the next morning, after a few hours of drinking and dancing, Kenya told her friends she was going to the restroom. She left her purse and her phone on the table and asked her friends to look after them until she returned. But Kenya never returned to her friends in the club. After she left to go to the restroom, some of the bouncers of the club had seen her stumbling as she walked due to her intoxicated state. And because of this, Kenya was forcibly removed from the club. Without her purse and cell phone, she just stood outside on the curb with no way to contact her friends or to retrieve her belongings. Back inside the club, Kenya's friends began to realize that she hadn't come back from the bathroom. The girls in the group looked inside the bathroom and around the club, but they found no sign of her. Instead of searching further, her friends figured that she must have left with someone she knew, or someone she had met, so they figured they would just keep her belongings safe and would get them back to her the next day. They didn't realize that among the belongings that Kenya had left behind were all of her personal belongings, including the keys to her home. But this was not her usual group of friends. Kenya had always had an arrangement with her best friends that no one would leave a club without each other and they would always text each other when they got home to make sure that they were all safe. Kenya's close friends later recalled that it was unlike her not to tell them where she was going. But these more recent friends didn't have such an arrangement, so the group didn't make any further attempts to find Kenya before they left the club that night. The next morning on Friday, April the 1st, 2011, Kenya's boyfriend Lewis woke up to an empty bed. 
He knew Kenya was out with friends the night before, but it was highly unusual for her not to return home, especially without letting him know that she would be staying with a friend overnight. Kenya was a loving girlfriend, and not showing up or contacting him was very unlike her. Nonetheless, when Lewis checked his phone, there were no messages, Snapchats, or missed calls from Kenya, and Lewis knew immediately that something was not right. He called Kenya's sister, Kim. Lewis knew how close the sisters were, and when something was wrong, Kenya would either go to Kim or himself. But he found that Kim hadn't heard from Kenya since the day before, and after hearing that she hadn't come home, she was worried too. As soon as Kim ended the call with Lewis, she called their parents to let them know that Kenya hadn't come home the night before. Kenya's parents both left work as soon as Kim told them that Kenya was missing. Together, they began pulling up phone numbers and Facebook profiles. They made contact with everyone they could think of that might know where Kenya was. This was when they discovered that Kenya had been out partying with another group of newer acquaintances, not the usual close friends that she partied with. Her friends told the parents, Maria and Tony, that Kenya had bailed on their plans the night before, saying that she had other plans, so they weren't sure where she was or what had happened. Not one of them had seen Kenya the night before. Eventually, the family was able to obtain the names and details of the people she had been at the club with that night. And that afternoon, two of the people in Kenya's group came to Tony and Maria's home to help figure out what was going on and to see if they could help. By this point, Tony and Maria were distraught. It had been almost 24 hours since Lewis had seen Kenya before she headed out with her group of friends, and there was still no word from her. Her parents asked question after question of the two friends. The friends revealed to Tony and Maria that she had been using a fake ID for a few months now, which kind of came as a shock to her parents. But this is not what they were worried about at this point. All they cared about was figuring out where Kenya was and ensuring that she was safe. But the information Tony and Maria got from the two friends made them uncomfortable. They handed over Kenya's phone, purse, and the keys that they had been left with, and told the parents that when she had left the belongings at the table and gone to the bathroom around midnight the night before, that that was the last time they had seen her. When they heard this, Kenya's parents were even more distraught. It was so unlike Kenya to go anywhere without her phone, and now that they had her phone in their possession, this possible way to find her had been eliminated. But Tony and Maria weren't giving up. Tony spent hours going through Kenya's messages in hopes that it would reveal some clue as to her whereabouts. But aside from the hundreds of texts and calls from her boyfriend Lewis, her sister Kim, and her friends trying to make contact with her, there was no recent activity on the phone that would give them any clue to help find her. That was until Tony was scrolling through her phone and found a single text message which read, Hey, this is Travis, the guy who gave you a ride last night, creepy white van. Did you get home okay? Tony read this message almost as soon as it arrived. The number was not saved in Kenya's phone, but the words ignited a spark of hope. Tony understood that this person might have information about Kenya's whereabouts. He immediately called the number, but there was no answer. So, he rang again, and again, and again. Still, no answer. Frustrated and sick with worry, Tony and Maria agreed it was time to get the police involved and to file a missing persons report. But when they contacted the local police station, they were told they would have to wait 72 hours before a report could be filed. The officer on the phone sounded unsympathetic, and he told Maria and Tony that they shouldn't worry so much as Kenya was likely hung over somewhere and would show up soon. Tony and Maria didn't know what else to do, so they printed hundreds of missing persons flyers and handed them out anywhere they could think that Kenya may have visited. The following morning, Tony finally heard Kenya's phone ring. It was the same number that had sent the strange text the day before and who Tony had been attempting to contact. The man on the other end of the phone identified himself as Travis Forbes. He told Tony the story about how he had come to have Kenya's phone number. Travis recalled he had been walking past the 24K club around 2 a.m. the morning before. As he approached the front entrance, he saw Kenya talking to a homeless man. He could tell that Kenya was intoxicated, and despite the cold air, she was only wearing a dress. 
Travis told Tony that he asked if she needed help, and she said yes. Kenya told Travis that she needed to get to her car, which was parked at another club. Travis drove her to the club, but when Kenya couldn't find her car, he offered to drive her home instead. Kenya told him the address of the apartment she shared with Lewis, and Travis told Kenya that the bakery he rented was close by to her apartment, so he was familiar with the area. During the drive, Kenya had told Travis that she wanted to stop for cigarettes. They pulled up outside of a gas station, and that's when Kenya realized it was closed. But she saw an Asian man standing on the curb smoking, so she got out of the van and began to talk to the man. Travis told Tony that the man's name was Dan, and Kenya and Dan had been speaking to each other in Spanish. Dan handed Kenya a cigarette, and then they walked away together, leaving Travis alone with his van. Travis told Tony that that was the last time he had seen Kenya. He sent the text the next day to make sure she had made it home safely. Tony found the story difficult to believe. First, it didn't make sense that Kenya wanted to get to her car when she didn't have the keys that were still in her purse at the club. And why would she want to stop for cigarettes with no money as her cards and cash were also in her purse? On top of all that, Tony knew his daughter wasn't the type to get in a van with a stranger. The story just didn't line up with the responsible and careful woman that Kenya always was. So after ending the call with Travis, Tony called the police again and he retold Travis's story. He begged them to be able to file a missing persons report, telling police that he had reason to strongly believe that Kenya was in trouble. But once again, his request was denied. Police claimed that Kenya still had not been missing long enough to warrant an investigation. Tony was extremely frustrated, and all he had to go on was Travis's strange story. So he called Travis again, asking him to recount the story. Travis suggested that Tony come meet him at the gas station where he last saw Kenya. Tony jumped at the chance to meet Travis, believing he might be coming face to face with the person responsible for his daughter's disappearance. So he agreed to meet Travis at the gas station, but he brought along his 9mm handgun and told his wife Maria where he was going. Maria was worried for Tony's safety and begged him not to go. She thought not only could the stranger be a psycho, but the whole situation was emotionally charged and she was worried that Tony might do something that he would later regret. She even tried to block the exit of their home as he left, but Tony pressed past her, determined to find his daughter. As soon as he left the driveway, Maria called the police again. She told them the situation and that Tony had taken a gun to meet with Travis. Even though the gun was legal in the state, she was worried that something bad might happen. Police agreed to go to the gas station so they would be close by if anything got out of hand. As Tony arrived at the gas station, a police officer was already there, and so were Travis and a friend he had brought with him. Tony looked Travis up and down and immediately felt some relief. Travis was a well-presented guy in his early 30s. He was fit with blonde hair and blue eyes. He hardly looked like the criminal Tony had been imagining in his mind. When Travis retold the story of the night before, he appeared genuinely concerned for Kenya's well-being. The details of the story were consistent with what he had told Tony over the phone and had pointed out spots where he had parked his van and where Kenya had walked off with Dan. But despite the consistency and Travis's clean-cut appearance, Tony still had a bad feeling about the story, and so did the officer who had been listening. The officer asked Tony to step aside while he asked Travis a few extra questions, so Tony complied with the request and walked over to Travis's white van. But when Tony was within a few feet of the van, he was hit with a strong chemical smell of bleach. His stomach dropped when Travis was done speaking with the officer. Tony quietly pointed out the smell from the van. The officer walked towards the van and was met with the same strong odor. So the officer asked Travis if he could take a look inside the van, and Travis willingly agreed and opened the doors. The storage area was spotless and lined with brand new carpet. In contrast, the front seat of the van was completely covered in garbage and food wrappers. This painted a pretty suspicious picture, and it clearly looked like great care had been taken to clean the back of the van, 
but this still wasn't enough for officers to question him further. Instead, he took a written statement from Travis and let him go. Before Travis left the gas station, he walked over to Tony to shake his hand and to tell him that he hoped his daughter was found safe. And then Travis burst into tears. His shoulders slumped with huge, uncontrollable sobs, which seemed to Tony to be totally out of place in this situation. He apologized, saying that he wished he had followed through on what he had started and just took Kenya home. And then he shook Tony's hand, got back into his van, and drove away from the gas station. Finally, after precisely 72 hours of being missing, Kenya's family were allowed to file a missing persons report. As the investigation began, Kenya's disappearance broke loose on both national and local news and was even reported in her birth country of Honduras. The family made appearances across news stations begging for the public to come forward with any information that might lead them to Kenya. I just worry every single minute because I don't know what's out there, what happened to her. She was of high intelligence. She didn't make the right decisions all the time, but what teenager does? Something made her leave that bar, not on her own will. I don't know if it was the date rate drugs, somebody slipped or something. We don't know any of those questions. Police say witnesses claim they spotted the teen at a gas station in a different part of Denver around 3 a.m. Friday. So far, investigators have been unable to find her. The story led to CCTV footage of Kenya at a local hotel being released. She can be seen in the foyer with another man. Kenya is clearly intoxicated and can be seen stumbling through the lobby. Travis Forbes' name was associated with the investigation from the beginning, given the story he had told Tony and the police, and he was the last known person to see Kenya. At the time of Kenya's disappearance, Travis was the maker of a brand of gluten-free granola bars. His kitchen was a small rented space located in the rear of another local bakery. On April 5, 2011, the owner of the bakery where Travis rented space came forward to police with CCTV footage taken on the night of April the 1st, the same night Kenya had gone missing. A woman named Monica Poole was the owner of Debbie's Bakery and was upset to learn that her CCTV system had malfunctioned when she checked on it on April the 2nd. She rewound the footage to see if she could understand what happened, and the last footage that had been recorded was of Travis. As a local, she was already aware of Kenya's disappearance, which prompted her to come forward. The CCTV footage shows Travis in the back of the bakery wearing long latex gloves, the kind used for cleaning. He can be seen rolling a cart, which is holding a large white cooler that has been duct taped shut into the bakery's freezer. He walks out of the back of the bakery carrying a bottle of bleach. He then returns inside and switches off the CCTV cameras. On April the 6th, police would bring Travis into the station for questioning. While in custody, he tells the same story about his interaction with Kenya. He also tells police that he went to his girlfriend's house after watching Kenya leave the gas station with the homeless man named Dan. This was around 3.30 a.m and that he left her house for work at 8.30 a.m. on the 1st of April. When police would question Travis's girlfriend, she would confirm his story. But police would soon take a closer look at Travis's story and discover some concerning inconsistencies. Reviews of Travis's phone records showed his phone had never been near his girlfriend's home the night Kenya disappeared. And Monica had already told police that she wasn't expecting Travis at the bakery on the 1st of April, which is why she was surprised to see him on the CCTV footage. Interviews with the neighbors of the bakery revealed even more disturbing clues. One neighbor had seen Travis cleaning a large white cooler in the back of his van on the afternoon of April the 2nd, while another had seen a 55-gallon barrel being burned outside of the back of the bakery on the evening of April the 1st. When Monica confronted Travis about the burning barrel, he told him that he had burned some marijuana, which had gone moldy in his cooler. He justified turning off the cameras because he didn't want to change clothes with the cameras on. When Monica gave the statement to the police, she added that Travis had scratches on his arms that day, which he claimed came from a homeless person attacking him. With the evidence mounting, the link between Kenya's disappearance and Travis's suspicious movements around that time were getting stronger. 
But Travis was still playing the Good Samaritan. He appeared in interviews on local news stations. In those interviews, he is highly emotional and sobs and apologizes for not getting Kenya safely home that night. I, have man, I'm sorry that I, that I was indifferent, that I didn't think anything. I didn't think anything. I didn't think she would, she was gonna disappear. <laughs> I could have, I could have walked with them. I could have been more, I could have been like, no, you know, no, you know, I'm going to take you home, you know, and I, you know, and, you know, been, I could have, I could have intervened more, you know, and not just said, okay, and, uh, and gone home. Despite being on the top of the suspect list, there was no sign of Kenya and no indication as to whether she was alive or dead. And with no conclusive evidence, Travis was allowed to remain a free man. But even so, Travis could sense the investigation into Kenya's disappearance was beginning to implicate him strongly. So he decided to disappear. Travis stole a friend's car and drove from Colorado to Texas in an attempt to get away from the spotlight. His escape was short-lived, however, when on the 4th of May, Travis was pulled over and arrested in Austin on suspicion of car theft. By this point, the investigators in Kenya's disappearance had uncovered more evidence against Travis, so they needed to interview him again in hopes that he would slip up and provide more information about Kenya. But his story remained consistent. Police were left with no new information except for a DNA sample they were able to obtain with a warrant. At the end of June, Travis was extradited back to Colorado to face the charges of car theft. But he was released when the friend dropped the case against him. Police had begun to believe they were dealing with a serial offender and decided to have Travis put under 24-hour surveillance. They were hoping that he would lead them to Kenya or at least make some mistake that they could hold him on while they continued their investigation. But Travis was well-behaved while investigators tailed him. He would go to bars and nightclubs, but other than getting drunk and yelling at a patron of a local bar, he didn't really do anything that would warrant officers arresting him. After three nights of surveillance, it was stopped, and Travis was free to do as he pleased once again. This was a fateful decision that continues to haunt investigators to this day. It was the 4th of July, and locals in downtown Fort Collins, nearby to Aurora, were enjoying the Independence Day fireworks display. Amongst the crowds was Lydia Tillman, a 30-year-old sommelier who had recently moved to the area after leaving New York. In the late evening when the fireworks had ended, she walked back to her apartment alone. As she pressed the key into her front door, she was pushed from behind by a man who she had not realized was following her home. Lydia fell onto the floor when she was pushed by the man, who immediately jumped on her and began to sexually assault her. And as he did so, the man would begin punching her in the head with blows that would break her jaw and cause severe head trauma. Lydia fought back as best she could. She kicked and scratched her attacker as she fought for her life. But his size made her frantic attempts to free herself futile. And after a few horrifying minutes, she would fall unconscious. Before the man escaped the building, he doused Lydia's broken body with bleach and set the apartment on fire. Police and fire services arrived within minutes and watched as the smoke billowed from the windows around Lydia's apartment. The flames began to climb up the side of the building as they unrolled the hoses and extended the ladders. To the astonishment of the emergency workers and people who were gathered below, a window on the second floor of the burning building opened and a woman, lacking clothing, was seen as she threw herself out of the window directly onto the pavement below. The woman was Lydia Tillman. She had barely survived the horrific attack and knew that she would likely perish in the flames, so she had thrown herself out of the window in a last effort to survive. When Lydia hit the ground, paramedics rushed to her aid, and she was immediately transported to the hospital. Tragically, Lydia suffered a stroke soon after she arrived and was placed into a medically induced coma for five weeks as doctors worked tirelessly to save her life. Police couldn't find any evidence of her attacker in Lydia's apartment due to the large amounts of damage around the home. But because Lydia had bravely fought off her attacker, she had managed to survive the event. Sorry, we're strangers hugging you. 
It's so good to see you. On many levels. Probably not a stranger to us. The people who for weeks worked to fix up Lydia are the ones who know her the best. <laughs> when investigators examined Lydia's body, they were able to collect DNA samples of her attacker from under her fingernails, which would be sent to the crime lab for DNA analysis. But in the meantime, investigators believed that the use of bleach in this case was similar to the circumstances in the disappearance of Kenya Monye. So police decided to restart their surveillance of Travis. In the early hours of July 10th, Travis was seen talking to a woman outside of a club for 30 minutes before the two would walk off together. Concerned for what might unfold, an officer approached Travis and began to ask him questions about his identity. Strangely, Travis gave the officer a fake name and address and appeared very nervous throughout their interaction. By this point, the woman Travis was with had walked away. And at this point, Travis had done nothing to warrant further questions, so the officer was forced to let him go. Just 20 minutes later, Travis would reappear, having changed outfits and put on a hat. And once again, he was seen approaching an intoxicated woman. And yet again, police were concerned for her well-being as the two began to walk away together. This time, officers weren't prepared to let Travis go, worrying he might have other intentions towards the woman that he was attempting to take away from the bars and clubs. So they made the decision to arrest Travis for providing a false name. It was only a misdemeanor offense, but at least it would keep the locals safe for that night. On the following day, which was July the 11th, at 10.45 p.m., just as Travis was preparing to walk free from the police station after securing bond, the DNA results from under Lydia's fingernails had come through. The DNA was a direct match for Travis Forbes. Travis was immediately arrested on suspicion of attempted murder, sexual assault, and arson against Lydia Tillman. One month later, Travis was interviewed in connection with Kenya's disappearance as well. But at this time, rather than deny any involvement as he had before, Travis tells police he's ready to talk, but only if they agree to two conditions. First, he demanded that when he gets to prison, he must not be labeled a sex offender. And second, prosecutors must not demand the death penalty in this case. Prosecutors agreed to the deal. And after five months from Kenya's disappearance, the truth about what happened would be finally revealed. In interviews with the investigators, Travis told them that he did indeed meet Kenya outside of the 24K lounge where she was talking to a homeless man. Travis was with a friend and together they asked Kenya if she needed help. She said she did. So Travis and his friend tried to get her a cab to get her back to her boyfriend's apartment. But there were no cabs around, so Travis offered to drop her at home. He dropped his friend off first and then continued driving toward Kenya's apartment. By now, Kenya was passed out in the front seat and Travis pulled over. He climbed on top of her and was attempting to sexually assault her. But as he did, Kenya woke up and began to fight him. In a panic, Travis strangled her to death in the front seat of his van. He stuffed her body into a cooler that he carried in the back of the van and then put the cooler in the freezer at the bakery, which was seen on the CCTV footage. I wanted to bury her either next to some water or next to some trees. Why is that? Because that's where I would like to be buried. If somebody had killed me, I would hope that they would bury me next to something nice. I just dumped me in some dumpster. The next day, he drove to Kenisburg, where he buried Kenya's body under a grove of cottonwood trees along Interstate 76. He returned to the bakery where he had put everything that had come in contact with Kenya, including the carpet from his van, into a 55-gallon barrel, which he burnt outside of the bakery. On the 26th of September, 2011, Travis appeared in court to be formally advised of the charges he was facing. He entered a guilty plea to the charge of first-degree murder of Kenya Monye and guilty to the attempted murder of Lydia Tillman. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for Kenya's murder, and a further 48 years were added for the attempted murder of Lydia. As stories began to be told about Kenya's horrific murder and the brutal attack on Lydia, 
more information came to light about Travis Forbes' extensive criminal history. He had been arrested for felony burglary, criminal harassment, and assault over a number of years. One thing was clear, as Travis got older, his crimes grew both in frequency and in violence. Ex-girlfriends came forward to share the details of his concerning obsessions with sexual role play. At the time of Kenya's murder, Travis was on probation for a domestic violence charge. All of this left many wondering how such a violent man was able to walk free for so long. Was it his seemingly trustworthy and clean-cut appearance that gave him the ability to blend in and prey on women so easily? Lydia will forever be a changed woman after Travis's horrific attack. After months of rehabilitation and surgery, Lydia had to relearn how to speak, walk, and drive. Go to therapy. The speech is slowed from the stroke she suffered after jumping from this second floor apartment to get away from him, Travis Forbes. Coma. You're in a coma? Yeah. Lydia Tillman is tough. She goes to physical therapy five times a week. That's got to be encouraging for you to see improvement. Yeah, yeah. Better every day. She runs twice a week. Two miles. Rip, rip <laughs> Weather permitting. Yeah. And relies on a notebook when the words don't flow. She tells me she still only wishes peace for Forbes, but she is forever linked to the family of Kenya Monhe, the young Aurora woman killed by Forbes three months before Lydia was attacked and even wears one of Kenya's rings as a symbol of that bond. Wanted me have, yeah. There is numbness on her right side. She can only chew soft foods. I have a long Road. But you can bet they are temporary restrictions. It's a very good shake. Yeah? Yeah. Obstacles to clear as the bracelet on her wrist reminds everyone she meets. Live your days in spires new. Nice job. She is hailed as a hero for her extraordinary display of strength surviving Travis's attack, which ultimately led him to being discovered as Kenya's killer. Lydia went on to study yoga and now speaks at various events around the country where she shares her inspiring story. During an emotional memorial service, Kenya's sister offered moving words in tribute to her. I'm not saying goodbye. I'm saying see you later. I'll see you when God calls me home with you. I don't quite understand why you had to leave us all so soon, but God always has a purpose. I'm not going to look at this as a loss. I'm going to look at this as a gain. I've gained my guardian angel, and one that I know I can trust. Rest in paradise, big sister. See you when it's my time. I love you. And you are always, and definitely are, missed. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below with your take on it, and subscribe to the channel. Also hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. And until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.